Well, we are really excited. Uh, I've known Brock for almost about six years now, hasn't it been? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he actually has become a really good friend. Uh, and so as I was thinking about this next uh, men's breakfast that we had, uh, I just thought, you know, it would be really wonderful, as I've gotten to hear more of Brock's journey over these last this two and a half years, uh, to have him share some of that with our whole group of guys. And so, Brock, thanks again for being willing to be here today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So um, you had a major life change that happened two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. You had a mountain biking accident, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Why don't you tell us, what was life like the day before your accident? Like what, what was all involved in, you know, work and family and all that type of stuff? It was a pretty chaotic day. Yeah. So it was a, a full work day, uh, and then we drove to the cities where we stayed at a hotel, um, my wife and two little boys that were three and 14 months. Yeah. And was working that night a little bit, dropped them off at the airport at sat Saturday morning at, you know, 6 a.m., and then drove back up to Duluth and worked all day. Yeah. And what do you do for work, Brock? I help people buy and sell houses. Yeah. So, like, low-stress job. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> So you were going at this, you know, going at life, small kids, you know, busy, running your own business. Mm -hmm. And then tell us about what happened on, was it August 10th? Is that right? Yep, August 10th, 2019. Yeah. So I drove up from the cities that morning and worked all day yep. and, you know, wrote offers, communicated with a lot of different buyers, with some sellers, with other agents, and you know, wanted to just do something fun for myself because my wife and kids were now in Dallas. I had 36 hours of bachelorhood before I was leaving. <laughs> and so I was going to go on a long, long mountain bike ride and I uh, had been out to Mission Creek Trails out in the Fond du Lac neighborhood, biked out there before. I uh, liked those trails because it really flowed and everything. And I uh, was looking at the map, didn't take uh, very long to look at it. And I uh, just noticed that there was a side trail that kind of connected back to like the main loop. And I'd never been on that trail before and was biking on it. And within a split second, I came up on a drop. Don't know exactly what happened from there, but my instincts probably kicked in, probably hit the brakes. And somewhere in there, went over the handlebars, landed on my head, broke my neck in two places. I broke the C1 vertebrae and the C7 vertebrae. Mm. And from there, you know, I was in a state of, you know, trauma where when I realized what was happening, I was laying on my back. My fingers were dancing before my eyes, sort of like a, you know, like a football player when they're looking for the football after they just got nailed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my fingers were just moving without my body doing it. It just was happening. Wow. And then uh, once I settled down a little bit, you know, I realized I tried to get up, couldn't move my body, yeah. and went into a state of panic for a short time. Realized that my backpack, well, I, I yelled help a couple times, which is pretty fruitless because I was in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the woods on a Saturday night on a mountain bike trail that I probably wouldn't have seen anyone until the next day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, my backpack had shifted to my left. So I was able to reach around my backpack to get in my to get my phone and then be able to make a 911 call <clears throat> which was huge in a sense of because it's so remote and service is really spotty out there yep. that just to get a signal to be able to make a call uh was huge. Yeah. And so here you are, you're out in the middle of nowhere on this trail. Somehow you're able to make a phone call, and yep. then the dispatcher, the 911 dispatcher, walks you through and just talks to you. And then what happened after that? Of like, how did they get people to you to, to you know, get you help? Well, I knew I was on the Mission Creek trails. I didn't know what trail I was on because wow. I literally looked at the map and said that one connects to here, so I'll just take that one and I'll come back. Um, and I was trying to explain it to the lady. Um, I think it's called Flower Something. It was called Flyover Country. And so uh, I had my phone on, and the city has an app they use to be able to 
see all the different trails throughout the city of Duluth. Mm -hmm. But they were able to ping my phone so they could see, okay, he's here, how do we get to him? And as the EMTs were getting to the trailhead, they were looking at the app and trying to figure out how do we get to him and get him out safely. Uh, another mountain biker who knows the trails really well got there and was looking at the map and he said, well, instead of going on the mountain bike trail here, go on this logging road and they were able to get to me with the ATV that has tracks on it. Yeah. And I landed about 20 feet from where that logging road connects to the trail. Wow. And that logging trail isn't on a map, so they wouldn't have seen it. So just having him be there was really huge. Yeah. And so they took this, they took this logging trail, they come find you, they yep. start to care for you. Um, what was going through your mind, like, when all of this is taking place? Well, I want to live. I want to see my wife. I want to see my kids. Uh, you know, it's that strange thought of like, this is where I die, out on a mountain bike trail in the middle of the woods. So you really alone. immediately went there. Like when you couldn't move your body, like you thought, I could die out here. Yeah, because I was laying on my back, I was just looking up at the sky and I could see the trees moving. And, you know, I was, it probably took 45 minutes to an hour to get to me from, I mean, because it's pretty far out there. Mm -hmm. So I was there for quite a while talking to the dispatcher and talking to Jesus as well. Just mm -hmm. like, Jesus, I want to live. I want to stand again. I want to be able to see my kids. And mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't listened to the 911 call, but it's on my list of things I hope to do. Yeah. That would be pretty emotional, I'm guessing, to try and yeah. dig into that at some point. Yeah. Okay, so, so many different things we could detail, but let's follow the arc a little bit. So they get you, um, they're able to do what they do to transport you safely, they get you to the hospital, and the medical staff starts to evaluate your situation. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about, like, when the doctor finally came in and said, here's what we're dealing with. What did he say, and again, kind of how did that, how did that hit you? Uh, you know, a lot of it is sort of blurry because yeah. of being in trauma. And, uh, you know, from getting out of the woods to getting in the ambulance, you know, my body was like super cold and, you know, it would it had freaked out. You know, everything mm -hmm. had gone stiff and fingers moving. And so once I got in like this calm state, it was sort of like the adrenaline had come down where I was just like in super chill mode and being in the ER uh, you know, that's when everything, be, everything shifted from like you're entering a new era of vulnerability when the nurse said, uh, we have to cut your clothes off. And my first thought was, you're going to see me naked. <laughs> 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 and, and she uh, says, we do that here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that out loud, but strangely, it was someone that I had known from high school like 20 years before. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, oh, this isn't supposed to be happening, but it's happening. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> I hadn't heard that part of the story. That's yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we did, a, I believe, a CT scan. And it probably took 20 or 30 minutes. It felt like two minutes. I'm, mm. it, it didn't take long. But they had mentioned I have a cervical injury. I don't know if they knew the extent of it at that point yet, but they knew that I'd broken C7, which is near your shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what that meant for the moment, for the next years of my life, for anything. And uh, they did surgery that night on my C7, put in some fusions there and several vertebrae. And then the next night, I also had a surgery as well. Yeah. So when I got to the ER, because there had been some time elapsing, when I was on the mountain bike trail, I had another guy who was also there um, make a... 911 was able to call my wife who was in Dallas and, you know, they were able to communicate with her that I had been in a bad accident and, and everything. So by the time I got to the ER, uh, I had two brothers there, two friends, uh, three friends, and then you were also there as well. Yeah. So by the, by the time I got to the ER, uh, there was people there 
And, you know, one of the more powerful moments in all of that medical stuff was, you know, you and Jeff praying for me. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to explain, but just this overwhelming sense of God's power, Mm -hmm. like just this Mm -hmm. confidence that he's got me, he's holding me, but just this strength that I felt. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you prayed for, but I remember that that sense, you know. Mm -hmm. That overwhelming feeling that God is powerful. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really holy moment to be there with you. I mean, you said I've I've known you for several years, and you know you had worked with us, helped us with our house, and and to see you in this really vulnerable state and just crying out like, "Oh God, come, help my friend," you know. Yeah. And just to hear again how. You know, we didn't know what that was going to look like physically for you at the time, but just mm-hmm. that you were able to sense God's supernatural power and peace to sustain you through all of that. So you had you had that first surgery, then you had a second surgery, and then how many surgeries did you end up having total? I had two neck surgeries, and then about four months later, I had a throat surgery as well. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, gotcha. So I broke the C1 vertebrae. The, that was the second surgery that they discovered after operating on C7. So the C1 vertebrae is your highest level vertebrae in your neck. Christopher Reeve, Superman, broke C1 and C2. So whenever you saw him talk, he always breathed through a straw, couldn't move anything from his shoulders on down. And if that would have bruised the spinal cord, you know, I most likely would have died because Mm -hmm. I was alone. And a lot of times you lose your ability to really control your diaphragm. So uh, it's a pretty amazing thing when a neurosurgeon tells you in like an unbelief like state, like I can't believe this happened. Like you broke your C1 vertebrae perfectly. <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> you broke out versus in. If you would have broke in and it would have bruised a spinal cord, you, you would have been you probably died. lights out. Yeah. And then like even the spot, the break was like, didn't he say like millimeters? Like if it would have been one way or another. Like yeah, he just basically said you were millimeters away from dying. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's like getting about as close to the edge of life as you can yeah. get. Okay. And so you're here, so you made it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it wasn't just like you had a couple surgeries and then you go home, right? I didn't go home for four months. Yeah. Okay. And so you were here in Duluth um, in the ICU um, trying to recover, and you had, you had some pretty major battles even in the midst of that, right? Yeah, so I had my uh, accident Saturday night on Tuesday morning. You know, you're, everything in your body is out of whack. Your blood pressure is out of whack. You know, I couldn't feel anything from my chest on down, couldn't move anything. And, you know, instead of being at a 180-degree laying position, you know, you're, they're trying to get your body more vertical. So that Tuesday morning, my dad was in the room. I'm connected up, you know, six, six different things. They can see my vitals. And as they're sitting me up, I'm like, boy, I feel really tired. And then all of a sudden, my heart stops, everything flatlines. And the next thing I remember is about six or eight people all around me. And I had told that they had chest compressed me to get the heart going again kind of thing. So the, my body was in a state of trauma, and it was doing things. <laughs> wow. That's good. Yeah. We'll get to a little bit more of kind of the spiritual impact of this later. We're kind of getting some of the details, but let me just pause there for a second. Like, like even guys just trying to take this in, like your heart stopped. Yeah. Like you you could have died right at that moment. Mm-hmm. What? I know that that's really impacted you, like as you think about that. Like, um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about, like how did that hit you that that you basically got – resuscitated back to life uh it's there's a lot of gratitude for just being alive and yeah. my heart working you know yeah. where those are things i just took for granted before mm. and it was also kind of a crazy moment because my dad was in the room so it's like he almost saw me pass away like mm-hmm. you know right before his eyes kind of thing yeah yeah for sure and then how about um just on the spiritual standpoint like thinking about uh passing from this life to the next, you know, how long before that, uh, that reality, uh, 
were you able to have that sink in a little bit? You know, if, you know, even immediately after you were resuscitated, like, oh my gosh, like they had to <laughs> bring me back to life. How much did that sink in even in those moments? Uh, even before then, when I was on the trail, yeah. I, you know, it was really close and there was a fight. I did not want to leave this earth. Mm. And, you know, my mom had asked me after my heart, heart stopped, are you ready to go to heaven? And I was like, no, I am not ready. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it wasn't like a, I'm peaceful and I'm ready to go into mm -hmm. the next life. It was like, no, I, I am not. Yeah. I, I, and one other element of this is that your wife, Amanda, was also pregnant, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you're yep. going to be expecting your third child. And so, yeah, so uh, she was very early on in her pregnancy. She was like eight weeks. So we had her first uh, pregnancy meeting with the doctor. And I saw, you know, was relieved that the baby was alive via FaceTime. Wow. In a ICU bed with a neck brace on and not be able to move three fourths of my body. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So much more we could talk about. Let's move ahead a little bit to um, some of the journey of beginning to step into recovery, you know? So, like, folks saw you come up here. You're walking with your arm braces. Like, it's been an amazing journey. Yeah. At the spot that we've just left the or the uh, story at, at this point, you're still paralyzed from your neck down. Is that right, basically? You know, I had use of my hands. Okay, that's right. You know, my right hand is about 50% as strong as my left hand. Mm -hmm. So that was affected as well, and everything can't move. Yeah, gotcha. What was that like, and what was what were the different things that went into trying to see your body begin to have some restoration, and what was that like to process through some of these questions, like, will I ever walk again? Will, you know, different things like that. Well, the night of my accident, I was talking to a friend after my surgery, and he talked about me... Uh, just processing out loud about like being in a wheelchair and not walking my daughter down the aisle and you know not being able to stand again and give my wife a hug and you know things like that it was sort of like my body brain processing all that and uh, you know I learned from the neurosurgeon that you're a C7 incomplete injury which means your spinal cord was bruised but it wasn't severed okay that's right I misspoke so there sorry we, uh, the prognosis was, I don't know mm. what's going to happen to you. Uh, you may have some recovery, but this is a really long process. 12 to 18 months, I was told. And uh, we don't know where your nerves are going to connect between the brain and the rest of your body, but, you know, time will tell. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I was praying to God in the ICU, just, you know, looking at the fruits of the Spirit, two really stuck out to me. Patience and peace. Mm. Uh, patience because I can't go anywhere. I physically can't leave this place. And patience for what God has for me physically, but all the other areas of my life too. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a big thing early on was just learning peace and patience in the midst of struggle. Yeah, that's for sure. And then I remember you would often have like worship music playing, right? Yep. Yeah, talk a little bit about like the impact that that made. One of my friends, he's a medical doctor, and if you've ever been to the ICU, it, there's all these noises, and beep, it, it beep. sounds like you're in <laughs> Vegas, you know? It just continues all the time, you yeah. know? And he had given me a set of headphones, so I would just close my eyes and, and listen to worship music mm. and just be with the Lord and... I've never cried so much in my life. Just mm -hmm. like the sadness of my new physical state and saying goodbye to my body, but also just being in that vulnerable spot with God and just being like, you have everything now. Mm -hmm. You know, like you have my body, you have my future, you have, you know, when you're in that like really intense state, it's easier for me to be vulnerable with God. Yeah. You know, like, it's right there. I'm living in this moment of need. Yeah. Lord. And experience that supernatural peace and his love really uh, covering over you. Yeah. Wow. There's so much I want to talk about. Let's keep moving forward, though. So yeah. um, would you talk us through a little bit about your next stages? So you guys went out to Denver first, right? And yep. then 
then you spent a good time in Dallas. Tell us a little bit about those two parts of your recovery and then what that looked like practically for you from being um, uh, not able to walk and, and you know, little, very little movement to some of that stuff beginning to be restored. We were in the ICU for 17 days in Duluth and then took a medical flight out to Denver. Mm -hmm. And I was there for about three and a half months. And most of the time was in inpatient. So I stayed at the hospital. And Amanda and our boys lived in an apartment a couple blocks away. And, uh, you know, we had family that would, and friends, that would come out and help Amanda with the boys and everything, just trying to help us raise kids in the midst of Amanda also trying to be there for me, but also be pregnant too. Mm -hmm. So a lot going on. Yeah, there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, so it was amazing to have all that help and everything. Yeah. And uh, Craig Hospital is a phenomenal uh, community of professionals that help people with brain and spinal cord injuries. Mm -hmm. So just the, the positiveness of being around so many people that are there to help you. And so, I mean, I, I learned how to live in a wheelchair in terms of wheel it faster to transferring from a wheelchair to a toilet, a wheelchair to a bed. How do I get from my bed to a wheelchair? How do I fill up my water bottle? How do I fill up my, how do I get food on a tray now that I'm in a wheelchair and it doesn't fit there? So it was a lot of learning wow. at, uh, at that stage. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then from after your time in Denver at Craig, then you guys went down to Dallas where Amanda's family's at and yeah. then had kind of a next stage of some of your rehab and everything. And then remind me again and tell us about kind of what the timetable was on that. Uh, we were down in Dallas for about seven months. Yeah. And uh, we stayed with my in-laws who have a one level living house because I was wheeling around the house in a wheelchair. Yeah. And also uh, Amanda had our baby Nora yeah. um, in February, so about maybe six months after my accident. So we were raising a baby plus two kids and me trying to rehabilitate my, my body. Yeah. And I worked out at a gym that focused on neuro injuries, spinal cord, brain injuries, strokes, you know, that all focused on that sort of rehab. Wow, wow. Yeah. So amazing. So from that time to where you're at now, can you just describe a little bit about what life even looks like physically for you and just re-engaging in work and different practical elements of life? So it's been an evolving process. So I had my first movement about a month after my accident where it was literally like my right knee could move in about an inch. And with a spinal cord injury, you have tone and spasticity where your body just involuntary moves. But this was incredibly exciting to see like a knee move. So there was and that some, was a month after your that accident. That was a month after my accident, yep. Wow. And my right big toe moved as well. And so it was like there's something connected down below here and we'll see where this goes. Yeah. And so it's been sort of a long, slow process of muscle groups waking up. My friend, who's a physical therapist here in Duluth, early after my accident said, if you can move it, you can strengthen it. Mm. Meaning you can move that part because the brain is connected to that glute, hamstring, calf, toe, whatever. If you can move it, you can work on strengthening it. And it's just been a, a slow process of like muscle groups waking up. And, you know, standing was a huge thing. And then being able to move a leg was like a huge thing. You know, just sitting in my wheelchair, just doing, you know, knee raises was like, I'm exercising, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm working it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's been, everything's been monumental. Yeah. In terms of, you know, a year after my accident, I got a driver's license. I didn't drive for a whole year, you know, and it was like I was 16 again down in West Duluth <laughs> with my mom <laughs> getting my driver's license again. <laughs> You know, <laughs> she take like you out for a milkshake afterwards <laughs> or something. <laughs> I don't know if I cried when I was 16, but I definitely cried when I was 39. Wow. <laughs> wow. Standing in line being like, I'm getting my license. I passed. <laughs> it's amazing. I can like get a cup of coffee on my own again. I know. It's huge. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. 
And so, like, you're continuing. You're doing training, strengthening, you know, every every week. You've got your regiment and all that. So yeah, that's going to work on with some tra- trainers three to five days a week, just lifting weights and, you know, trying to get muscle groups stronger and everything. And yeah. walk on the treadmill at home. Yeah. Have an Airdyne bike at home. But basically anything that I do is exercise. Yeah. You know, fill in the dishwasher, move my legs in that certain way. Yeah. You know, picking up after the kids, you know, any movement that I do is exercise. Wow. Gotcha. Well, shift gears a little bit. That's, I think it's really helpful for folks to know kind of the arc of what you faced physically. Yeah. Let's talk about the other side, you know, emotionally and spiritually. There's so much that's going on these last two and a half years. Yep. Go ahead and take a drink. And uh, I know that's been a journey, right? Um, I know in talking with you, there's an immense amount of gratitude that you have, and you've already talked a little bit about that. But um, maybe let's talk about the other part first. Um, this hasn't been without disappointment or grief, right? So what are some of the ways that you've experienced that end of uh, things in this journey? Uh, letting go of who I was physically and the things that I loved doing for fun, but also just necessary things like being the husband who lifts the uh, groceries from the car to the house. That's a hard thing for me. Or lifting my cup of coffee from my car into my house and going up a step or two. Like uh, a lot of grieving with that stuff, letting go of what I thought my life was going to be like at 50, 60 years old physically. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I entered this phase after my accident of, letting go of everything, and I, I call it the unknown, where I, I trust it in the Lord, where it's, I don't know what's going to happen with my body, with the future, but it was a lot of giving up control. Mm. Um, and then the world went through the unknown with the pandemic. Exactly. And, so like and I'd already been there for like seven months. So yeah. <laughs> it was, you got a head start on all <laughs> the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Gotcha. How about um, one of the things you've mentioned to me a number of times is the surprising number of people that you find out about that you've never met before that are praying for you, yeah. that are caring about you. Talk a little bit about that and this, the impact that that had on you. I don't exaggerate when I say this, but there's been literally thousands of people that have reached out, prayed, sent us letters, cards, and it still happens to this day where I meet people that know what happened to me that are just so excited to see me stand like physically in front of them and that have mentioned praying for us. Like a couple nights ago, we were on a date and someone we didn't know before the accident but have now since become friends with, I just texted, hey, I just wanted to let you all know from August 2019 until January 2020, I wrote Brock's name down every day in my journal uh, and prayed for him. And just to have that is super humbling to know that so many people have loved us, cared about us, prayed for us, literally thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to know that so many people, like the body of Christ, like literally, you know, wrap their arms around us, Mm -hmm. you know, with watching our kids with helping us move several times, with giving us meals, very practical things, the letters, you know, comments online, text messages, people just letting us know, but also money, like medical stuff and everything that I've been through with rehab, it costs money. People probably donated eighty or $100,000. Wow. Um, so the body of Christ, like seeing that through this accident, was amazing to see like how big it is. Like mm-hmm. here we are in a room and then it's like Duluth, Minnesota, the US, the world. You know, here like missionaries have been praying for us with their supporters for years and churches in the Iron Range that I've never been to have been on their prayer list for multiple years and it yeah, it's it's pretty amazing to Yeah, it's gotta feel be very humbling, love. right? Super humbling. Because I'm not thinking about all of them very often. Yeah. You know, it sounds bad, but 
I can't think of thousands of people, you know. Yeah. 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 But to humble yourself in order to receive this unconditional love. Yeah. When that is not so much of what it takes. You know, we think about God and how much God loves us. Yeah. That the step into that is this humility of like, I need this. Yeah. I don't deserve it. Yeah. It's overwhelming, but I'm just going to say yes to it, right? Yeah. And just receiving that love is, you know, especially early on when I was so vulnerable and who knows what was going to happen with our family. How was I going to be a dad? How was I going to be a husband? Would I ever recover anything? How was I going to live life in a wheelchair? You know, all those questions. Mm -hmm. And to have so many people reach out then was an amazing need fulfilled with that support. But it still happens to this day that people care about us, love us. Yeah. Even like little practical things like someone opening a door. Yep. You know, for me that is helpful. I can do it myself. But I think there's also something in us that we love to give. We love to just help other people. And I, a lot of times I just let them do that because I think it makes them like feel good mm -hmm. that they helped a guy that is walking around on arm crutches, you know? Yeah. So yeah, the body of Christ, I mean, prayed for us in person, prayed for us on their own has just been, mm -hmm. visited us from people flying in to see us. Without friends and family, it would have been, or God, just impossible. Yeah. It would have been a really miserable experience. Yeah, that's tremendous. Um, Brock, what else do you think, you know, with your journey with God over these last two and a half years, how, how has your period of physical recovery that you've been on, what's the correlating arc of, you know, you've talked about like spiritual renewal. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Like, what are some of the things that you feel like you've learned about God, you've learned about yourself, and how is that shaping even how you're wanting to move forward in your life um, from here on out? I think personally letting go of some of those, like, ambitions and I'm going to do this and, you know, like letting go of control, as in, like, I'm going to make this happen. It's in my hand and it's really held tightly. I think a lot more is just open-handed, mm. you know, it's just letting go of control has been a big part of it. Yeah. I think for other people, I feel more grace, mm. more empathy, more forgiving and less to jump on, you know, judgment or uh, why are they being an idiot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you have <laughs> those thoughts too? A little bit more grace for okay. people, I think. <laughs> I hope. You yeah. Know? More empathy for people that are going through some really hard things. Mm. Yeah, physically, emotionally, mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. Here's another question uh, as far as just the heart level. Uh, you, know, you had the blessing of uh, foundation of a really strong walk with Jesus, you know, uh, heading into this accident and, and your recovery. Mm -hmm. um, imagine for a moment, like, what would have been like if you didn't have that? Yeah, you know, I, I experienced this injury with other people that also had this injury. And to be at a hospital and just seeing other people not have as much support or they became, I see a lot of people that became bitter and angry and depressed and sad. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, hope that comes from God, beyond just my physical recovery, just hope in life mm -hmm. that God has good things for us and loves us and cares about us, whether he heals me or not, yeah. was like a, a big thing for me because I was in a state of unknown. Will God heal me? Will he not heal me? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just having hope in life. Um, I mean, it's, it's been a, it's not all positive. It's been a real struggle walking mm -hmm. with God. You know, I found I always want something more. As in, when I thought I was going to die, I wanted to live. When I wanted to, when I realized I was going to live, I wanted to stand. When I realized I could stand, I wanted to move a foot. You know, there's always been, and so, you know, like you read in the Bible about the paralytic that is raised down through the roof. You know, thousands of people have prayed for me for a complete healing. And I have had a lot of healing, 
but I still would love it all. Mm-hmm. You know, all of the the physical healing. So that's a beautiful thing to ha- feel that healing that I've experienced, but also I want more, Lord. Yeah. I want it all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it it's a mixture of gratitude and hope, but also sometimes disappointment just because life is hard, you mm-hmm. know, with, you know, just moving my body, anything that I do moving on my body takes a lot more thought, planning and effort. How am I going to get, you know, my stuff from this part of the house to the other part of the house where before I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, maybe second to last question. Uh, you've been doing some reading with other folks that have had kind of near death experiences, you yeah. know, and relating to that. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about when you think about heaven, you know, and heaven, you know, isn't necessarily like when we think about that, it's like it's more of a, a reality of God's presence, less than like a new address, you know. But like when you think about life beyond this life, how is that different now versus, you know, um, July of 2019? You think about eternity and then even how that shapes how you live today. I have more of like a longing for heaven. You know, the Bible talks about heaven being our home. Mm-hmm. And there's more of like a more connection to the next life and with letting go of some things here. There's like this sense that I was almost there, but I'm still here. So it, there's this sense of like, I mean, I didn't see the light. I didn't physically meet Jesus or anything in my mm-hmm. experience, but like other people have in uh, books that I've read and mm-hmm. things like that. But there's like a longing for heaven mm-hmm. that I, I did not have before. And just also, you know, when you go through something hard and then I, I notice other people's hard things more and I feel them more, I, they, they're weightier to me now mm-hmm. than they were before. You know, it's like, I'm not sure what that is, but. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. Um, last question. Um, maybe just turn this outward a little bit. Um, so as guys are hearing your story and your journey, you know, you may not know specifics of what all these guys are going through or any of us, but what would be like a word of encouragement, you know, based on what you've experienced, um, what you've been walking through, whatever struggles, obstacles that any of us might be facing, what word of encouragement would you, would you give us to close? Uh, there is a, a God that loves us. He wants the best for us. He's prepared an incredible place in the afterlife for us. Um, I think for me personally, there was a lot of like letting go of control. Like I'm a guy, I make things happen. And this made me like let go of, Mm -hmm. I I can do everything on earth. I can just make it happen. And it's, there was a lot more of a need for God in all areas of my life because it was so apparent for me that I I couldn't do anything without someone else's help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times before it was like, I can just make this happen so that, giving up things to the Lord, disappointments, sadness, I didn't get the job, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. I think that need for God in all areas of your life um, has been a big theme for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I could summarize that, a lot of what I hear is that you have come to a real peace that being dependent on God is maybe the very best place to be. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has been. Even as it's very vulnerable. Yeah. But compare that to self-sufficiency or whatever else. Like this is, there's actually a richness that can be experienced there. Yeah, absolutely. It's letting go of that control and depending on God for everything. You know, mine was very apparent and still is because it's physical. People can see that. This guy walks with arm crutches. And I, I need him beyond just the physical, you know, that comes with that Mm -hmm. the mental the emotional the spiritual the disappointments in life so that need for god and depending on him for filling my heart with joy and love and peace and patience the fruits of the spirit Mm -hmm. that's great anything else that you want to share that we didn't get to um i'm not sure that's great you did awesome can we give brock a hand this is so amazing
Thank you. We'll pray for us. And so. okay. Um, I'm going to pray for us to, to finish. Um, often when we do our men's breakfast, we'll have a little discussion time, but we wanted to give uh, a longer time period for Brock to share his story and for all of us to take that in. So I'll pray for us. We'll dismiss. If you want to hang out and just uh, uh, have some conversation, um, I don't know how much energy you have to you know, talk to everybody, but if you want to ask, okay, we can do that and everything. Yeah, John. Um, you know, we're going to finish up, um, so yeah, so that's fine, because uh, we usually do this at uh, just an hour and a half, so let me pray for us, and then we'll dismiss. If you want to hang out some more, you can go ahead and do that. God, thank you um, for uh, the example that we've gotten to see and hear in Brock this morning. Um, God, he's a really good guy, but uh, <laughs> Lord, ultimately, it's it's your goodness in him that... Uh, we're inspired by, and that draws us in. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, just like, really leverage uh, entering into Brock's story in a way that could help us to turn to you with greater dependence, to release those things that we just hold on to, um, to try and manipulate and control, try and fix and God, we, we want to turn to you and just say, uh, in your hands is a much better place. <laughs> so I've got to pray about that in a couple of different directions. You know, there might be some of you guys here today where, you know, where Brock was talking about this hope that has been such an anchor for him um, in his life and through his accident about this faith in Jesus. That if, if you're in a spot where you haven't had that hope, it's as simple as just turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I need you. I can't fix myself. I can't do this. Would you just come into my life and help me move forward? I want to learn what it means to follow you. Yeah, so God, if there's any guys today that that would be a, maybe even a first bit of turning, would you just help them to do that this morning? And then, God, um, for all of us, when we think about um, the things that we hold on to that trip us up, God, could we do that step of surrender just to trust you rather than ourselves? Walk us through that process, God, we pray. More of your power and your peace, God. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give Brock one more hand.